All right, as you say to your hellos and you can find your seat, if you would be turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 6 this morning, Acts chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, Acts chapter 6 this morning, we do want to wish you, I'll extend my happy Mother's Day to you as you're turning there and say what a pleasure it is, how thankful we are for every mom, for uh, those who are biological moms, adopting moms, uh, for those who are foster moms, for those who are spiritual mothers. Uh, for every woman who, and I, was, I believe whether you have children or not, for every woman who seeks to live for the Lord and allow who Jesus is to radiate through your life in such a way that you help point others to him, that you have influence in the lives of others, thank you for, for what you do. The reality is that the church is better because of you. Our lives are richer because of you. And uh, we're grateful for you today. And we pray that you'll be encouraged by it. Yeah, we can, we can, we can thank them for that. Yeah. Yes. I'm thankful for my mom today. I'll call her and somebody asked me if I'd called her this morning. I didn't know what time she would be up, so I haven't talked to her yet because I get here early, but I plan to talk to her later today. And my mom was such a big part of my, and continues to be a big part of, of, of encouraging me in my walk with Jesus. She was a big part of me coming to faith in Christ. And my mom was bold in her, one of the things that always stood out to me is her boldness. I remember um, on a number of occasions that we would be in the doctor's office and my dad had a lot of health issues and we went through multiple years of battling with cancer and heart disease and a lot of things before he passed away. But I remember many occasions where we were in doctor's offices, where we were uh, in the hospital, where my mom would um, be talking about everyday things and somehow could turn that conversation to talk to somebody about Jesus in a way that seemed so natural that it was like she was talking about one of her kids or talking about her parents or talking about a friend. It just came naturally from her. I, I remember um, my mom and my dad would often, we, I was in a small town of about two or 3,000 people and um, our church uh, was a small church, a country setting, but, and people, everybody knew about one another, but somebody would share about a family member who, who didn't know the Lord or somebody who um, maybe had once been in church, who wasn't anymore, and their concern and their heart for them. And my mom and dad would mark that down in their mind. And they would begin to pray, and they would, they would find some occasion to go and to visit those individuals and to look for some opportunity to, to leverage that conversation to talk to them about Jesus. They would pray before they went and then ask the Lord if he would to allow them the opportunity to talk to that person about the Lord, about knowing him, about connecting to him, connecting to his people. And I've always admired that boldness about her and the natural sort of something about her. And, and, and I'm thankful that that's not only true of my mom, but like there are others of you in the room. Like I see that in you. I've experienced that with, with some of you in your own walk with the Lord. Um, but, but others of us may say, well, I'm glad that there are people like your mom who are like that. And I'm thankful there are other people in our body who are, who are perhaps sort of geared and natured that way. But, but sort of why would it matter if I am that way? Why would it be important if you were to be a bold witness for Jesus? And I would say to you, I would encourage you with the reality that our world is so full of brokenness and the need for Jesus that it's very important that you be living for him. Do you know that there are literally hundreds of millions of people across the globe today who have never heard the name of Jesus and who have never had the opportunity to even respond to the gospel? Do you realize there are literally hundreds of millions of people across the globe today who do not have the Bible in their own language, who, who do not experience the revelation of God in this book that, that I have, like multiple, multiple copies and different various translations and iterations of the Bible, like they don't have a single copy of the Word of God in their heart language to be able to hear what God would want to say through, to them through His Spirit by the prophets and by those who had gone before. They don't have that access for themselves, literally millions, hundreds of millions of people around the globe. Closer to home, every single day in your workplace, in your school, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your family, and even people that you will rub shoulders with at church on occasion, there are people who have no sense of where to find hope or joy or peace, and they're looking for it in all the wrong people and in all the wrong places. There are people who, for whom if this is their last day on earth, that they are going to enter into a Christless eternity, separated eternally from God and from all things beautiful, forever separated from him. And so it is of critical importance because we have, think about it, we have the answer to all of those needs. 
We have been entrusted as stewards of the gospel, which literally means it is, it is good news. Good news has been entrusted to us. If you're saved, then it's the good news that has transformed your heart. And we now have been, been given that good news to, to, to be able to u- be utilized by God to take that good news to our neighbors and to the nations to help them to know how Jesus can save, how Jesus can transform, how Jesus can give life, how Jesus gives purpose, how Jesus gives meaning. And so if we're, if we're not going, if we're not sharing, if we don't have a heart for that, then the question becomes why? What is it that makes a bold witness for Jesus? Where does a bold witness come from? Well, this morning we're beginning our journey in Acts to look at a, we, so far the, the first several chapters focus really on the leadership of the 12 apostles and what's happening in Jerusalem. But if what Jesus prophesied is to be true, and it is, that it's going to move beyond Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to the, to the ends of the earth, then more people will have to be involved than just those 12 apostles. And so, and so we begin to see here in chapter 6 that God uses men like Stephen, and we'll see in a few weeks like Philip, and then of course the apostle Paul and others who are beginning to stretch the the impact of the gospel beyond Jerusalem out to ultimately to the nations. And doing so for Stephen, spoiler alert, is going to cost him his life. But long before Stephen gives his life for the gospel, we find him live his life for the gospel. And, And so as we look at just a few verses in chapter six today, here's what my prayer has been this week is that you and I would see what it is about Stephen that made him a bold witness for Jesus, that as we do so, that God would stir in our hearts, would prompt us to pray that God would raise up a generation of such witnesses in our world, in, our, in the brokenness of our culture today. And as we pray toward that end, that we might, be, we might wrestle with the question of, what if God wants to use me, God wants to use your life as a bold witness for the gospel? Where does it come from? What does it look like? Here's sort of the big idea that I want us to see in the second half of chapter 6 this morning. It's this, that a bold witness for Jesus lives full of the Spirit, is confident in God, and shines for Jesus. A bold witness, and that could be you, a bold witness lives full of the Spirit, is confident in God, shines for Jesus. And so where does a bold witness come from? Number one, it comes from a person who, someone who will live full of the Spirit, We saw at the beginning in chapter 6 last week, we saw that as the church is growing, it's grown from 120 in a room praying to literally now tens of thousands in a relatively short period of time that some needs have fallen through the cracks. And so the apostles set apart another set of leaders to help administer needs specifically to Greek-speaking widows so that they would have the food that they need to be able to survive. And, And among those seven men is a man named Stephen. And among the qualifications for that, if you look up in chapter 6 and verse 3, it says of those men, including Stephen, that they were to be men of good reputation, notice, full of the spirit and of wisdom. And then if you look down at chapter 6 and verse 5, we saw last week that as the names of these seven men are given, that it says specifically of Stephen that he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now we're down to verse 8, where we'll pick up with the new uh, material that we're looking at today. And in verse 8 it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. And so God is working, allowing, um, is working miracles through Stephen so that those would be signs that would direct people's attention to Jesus, to know Christ and have a relationship with him. But the power for that and the experience of those miracles even in and through his life is a result of him, what he is filled with. Three times, and again, the Spirit of God doesn't stutter when he's riding through Luke. So when we see something show up multiple times, it is that God is driving this home. There's something that has filled, that, has, that is controlling, that is abounding in, that is overflowing out of the life of Stephen that makes him the man that he is, that allows him to have the impact that he has. And so imagine for a moment, if you will, that you go to the movie theater or you were in a, um, in a sports arena. And you're carrying a bucket, and that bucket is fairly full. And so as you're moving about, you bump into others, and whatever, and as you do so, something spills out. And the question is, what is it that spills out of your bucket? Well, it's whatever it's full of, right? And so as, uh, as we live our lives, I want you to imagine in your mind as if as you live your life, as you bump into people every day in your home, in your workplace, in your school, as you go about your daily routine, as you interact with others, as you bump into others, whatever is in you, whatever you're full of is what's going to spill out of you. 
whatever you're abounding in, whatever is in control of you, whatever has authority in your life, whoever or whatever, whatever it is that you are living in the fullness of is what's going to overflow out of your life and impact the lives of those around you. And what makes Stephen a bold witness for Jesus is that he is both motivated and empowered to tell others about Jesus because he is, he is full of the Spirit of God. And the encouragement that I would have for us this morning is that that's not just a reality that can impact Stephen's life, that he has access to the presence and the resources of the Spirit of God in him, but that is a resource, that is a promise to every believer in this room this morning. This is the book of Acts we've seen again and again tells us that, that as we come to faith in Christ, for every Christian, the moment that you got saved, the Spirit of God, no less God than the Father, no less God than the Son, God the Spirit comes to indwell you, living inside of you. And he comes to, to take up residence in your life. And if you're saved, there's nothing you can do to drive him out. He is there. He is a permanent indwelling reality in your life. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, he is there with you. God with you. Resurrection power that we just sang about in you. But there is a difference between him being resident in you and him being president over your life. There is one thing to be indwelt by the Spirit, but there is another thing that the, the book of Acts speaks of is us being filled with the Spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit is not me getting more of the Spirit. It is the Spirit having more of me. It is the Spirit of God having control. It's me surrendering to Him daily in such a way that says, God, I can't live this life in a way that would honor you. I can't, I can't impact people for your glory. I can't live in a way that would let who you are be reflected through me. But you can. And so, Jesus, this morning, I want to die to myself, and Spirit of God, would you live through me? Would you speak through me? Would you act through me in such a way that who you are would be evident in my life? Because 1 Corinthians 3, I believe it is, Paul says that he can be, again, the Spirit of God can be in you. You can be indwelt by the Spirit, but you can live as a fleshly or a worldly Christian because he is dwelling in you, but he is not in control of you. God sent his spirit, not just to sort of hang out, but to be in authority and to empower and enable and motivate you to live in me, to live in such a way that who Jesus is can be seen in us. That's a miracle that who he is can be seen in our lives. And when the spirit comes and when we are living in the fullness of his spirit, the spirit brings with him other resources that Paul, or rather that Luke mentions here when he talks about these things that he is full of, these other realities, he's full of these things because he is living in the fullness, he is abounding in, he's controlled by the spirit. And so he says here, for example, he is full of wisdom, verse 3. Wisdom is not just knowledge, it is the ability to apply truth to everyday circumstances, spiritual truth to everyday realities. And what happens is that when you and I live with wisdom, then we have this uncommon something about us that helps us to see life differently, to interact with life differently, and other people around us will see what God, what that unusual sort of something as the Spirit leads, that we have the wisdom to handle things in ways that they don't, that we're equipped to handle things in a way that they are not, and they'll want to know the source, and then we get to tell them about Jesus. The wisdom of God in us draws people to him. He says in verse 5 that because he is indwelt by, filled with the Spirit, he is full of faith. He's a man, Stephen is, that he trusts God fully, that he is in control, that he uh, he is in charge, that he is at work in the world, that he is simply joining God in what he is doing. In the same way, when we, again, when we are full of the Spirit, then God provokes within us. He stirs within us a faith to believe, God, you are in control. God, you are on your throne. God, you are at work, and I get to join you in what you're doing. And it stirs me to faithful action. It says in verse 8 that because he is living in the fullness of the Spirit of God, that he is full of grace. He has experienced God's grace and extends that grace to others. The most effective witness, isn't this true? Think about it for a moment. The most effective witnesses that I have ever known, when I spoke about my mom or when you think, the most effective witnesses that I know are people who are gracious in their their attitude and in their heart. They're not people who are demanding, who are judgmental, who are legalistic, who are authoritative, who are declaring rules and regulations. The most effective, powerful witnesses of the gospel that I have experienced in my life are those people who are so overwhelmed that God and his goodness would save them and transform them that out of that then we in turn would extend that same grace to others. 
And they would experience the kindness and the goodness and the favor of God through us toward them. Even when they are ridiculing us. Even when they are mocking us. Even when they are attacking us. And it makes Jesus attractive to them. Because they were filled with the Spirit. Because Stephen is. Because we can live in the fullness of the Spirit of God. It says in verse 8 that he has power. It's the Spirit of God. Who in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. And he will enable you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It is not Stephen's charm. It is not Stephen's charisma. It is not Stephen's training. It is God at work through him that empowers and enables him to be a powerful witness, a, a bold witness for Jesus Christ. And so imagine that as Stephen is going about his duties that now we know because of chapter 6 include caring for Greek-speaking widows, making sure that these widows have what they need to survive, the food, the basic necessities provided through the church, administered by men like Stephen, that as Stephen is going about his daily routine, what's inside of him, what he's full of, overflows, impacts those around him. As he, as he bumps into others, as he lives his life and bumps into them, what he's full of flows out. The question becomes, what is it when people bump into you, what, what overflows out of you? When you've had a really bad day at work and you come home, what is it that your family experiences out of you as you bump into them? When somebody wrongs you, mistreats you, attacks you, maligns you, then what is the response that overflows out of your life and out of my heart that they can see and experience in us? Whatever it is that we live in the fullness of, whatever it is we're controlled by, whatever it is that we're abounding in is what others will encounter as they bump into us. And by the grace of God... We can live in the fullness of the Spirit of God. We can live surrendered to the Spirit of God. We can live under the control of the Spirit of God in such a way that power and grace and faith and, and wisdom overflow out of us. And others would see that in us. They would see Christ in us. And we get to tell them about Jesus. Where does a bold witness come from? A bold witness comes from someone who lives filled with the Spirit of God and prompted and empowered by him to tell others about Jesus. Live full of the Spirit. But notice, secondly, where does a bold witness come from? It comes from someone who is confident in God. Someone who's confident, be confident in God. Luke is setting up this final day in the life of Stephen, but as we've seen throughout the book of Acts, wherever God is at work, so is Satan. It's sort of like some of you maybe have never had this experience because you're city people, but if you ever lived out in the country, if you turn out a light on out in the country, when the light comes on, what comes? Bugs, right? Like when the light goes up, when the light shines bright, all of a sudden, it's like every bug in the area is drawn to it, is attracted to it. Whenever God's light is shining, you can be sure that every, every bug, if you will, of Satan, every, every demonic thing will be drawn to try to cover up and hide and, to, and to, um, to, to bring darkness where God is shining light. Luke is helping us see that as Stephen is declaring Jesus is living for Jesus, is living in the fullness of the Spirit of God, as the church is on the move, that Satan is at work as well. And as he is, if, if Stephen is going to be a witness for God, he's going to need courage. But it's not the courage. Listen, this, I, I love in our, in our pastor's um, discussion this week as we were reviewing the message and it sort of challenged my heart again, that reminder. That courage is not me trying harder. That courage is not me leaving this morning saying, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, more, I'm going to be stronger for God. I'm going, to, I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to commit this morning that I'm going to tell at least five people this week about Jesus, doggone it. One way or the other, I'm going to make it happen. That's not courage. Courage that we need to, to stand for Jesus when, when challenges come in a world that where Christ is radiating and shining, where Satan will want to bring darkness. The courage that we need, the confidence that we need is not self-confidence. It's God confidence. 
It's the confidence that can step back and say, God, you are in control. You are over all things. You are at work in the world. You are drawing people to yourself before I even utter a word. You are already working in that person's heart. And so it's not up to me. It's not up to my power. It's not up to my charisma. It's not up to my training. It's not up to my memorization of an outline. It's not up to me going out on a Tuesday night visitation. It is simply me living under your control and trusting you to do your work through me. Verse 8, Stephen it says that he was, God is doing miracles through him. It's capturing people's attention. You can imagine then that other people don't care for this if they don't believe this Jesus message. So verse 9 says, some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, that included Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia. Asia, these are around sort of the Mediterranean Sea. They rose up and they argued with Stephen. So in this Greek-speaking Jewish synagogue, this place of worship for a Jewish people there, They begin to rise up, and the word there says, we can imagine Stephen saying that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law, and this sort of wrinkles some of them, and it says they began to argue, and that word is the idea they formally debated him. and, And the tense there is that it was an ongoing conversation. So as Stephen is out making sure that these Greek-speaking widows' needs are being met on behalf of the church, he's encountered these Greek-speaking Jews who are asking questions, and he is talking about Jesus. And as he does so, there is a, a discourse that occurs that probably starts out kind and gracious enough, but over time gets a little more contentious because, verse 10, they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. They don't, have the, they don't have the ability to, the, res, the response to refute them because the, the wisdom of man is no, is no, the reasoning of man is no match for the wisdom of God given by the Spirit of God. And so it's not that Stephen is smarter. It's not that Stephen is better educated. It's not that Stephen is uh, seminary trained. It's not that he's a better debater. It said the Spirit of God is speaking through him just as Jesus promised in Luke 12 when he said that when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. He's living in the fullness of the Spirit, and so the Spirit gives him wisdom in that moment to know what to say, and the wisdom of God is such that, that man cannot refute it, and so, and so when they can't overcome it and they're not going to believe it, then they rouse up other people. Verse 11, they secretly induce, they sort of behind the scenes are trumping up these charges, and they're stirring people to say, hey, go and tell them that we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Because they know that this will get him arrested. They know this will get him in trouble. They know this will put him on the hot seat. And that's exactly what happened. Verse 12, they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes. They came up to him and they dragged him away, forcefully dragged him away and brought him before the council. Verse 13, they put forward false witnesses. So now he's before the highest authority of the land. And these false witnesses are brought forward. And they said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. We've heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. If you go back, that sounds a lot like the charges brought against Jesus before this same group. They're misrepresenting, though. They are distorting his words. They... Stephen is saying Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than the temple. Jesus is greater than our traditions. But they're twisting it and misinterpreting it. Because they can't refute him, then what do they They resort to lies and to wrangling the crowds and twisting his words. They get the religious leaders involved. They get the general population worked up. Listen, is this not Satan's playbook that we see played out in our culture again and again and again? That if a man or a woman or a body of believers or a group of believers will dare to in the fullness of the Spirit of God to stand up and talk about Jesus, that if you walk in his name, if you live for his glory, when the world can't refute what we say, then what do they do? They'll result in name calling. They'll twist your words. They'll accuse you of hard things. They'll try to silence you. They'll create chaos around you. And when that happens, we may be intimidated. We may be tempted to sort of back up and say, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I don't know that I'll know what to say. I don't know that I'll know how to respond. I'm not sure that I can handle a backlash. But God is desiring to, and I believe he is, raising up bold men and women 
full of the Spirit of God, trusting in His presence, in His wisdom, to speak His truth in love, even when we are ridiculed and misunderstood. Why? Why is this so important? Because people need Jesus. Because apart from him, there is no hope. When we say that the reason we exist at Woodland Park as a people, as a body of believers, we desire, we proclaim Jesus because what else would we proclaim? And you say, listen, I get this because one of the, one of the, one of the great challenges of telling, talking to other people about Jesus is that many of us are terrified that in that moment we may not know what to say. Here again, another passage, Luke 21. Jesus is talking about the future, verse 12, Luke 21, 12. Before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you and deliver you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. I'm going to use the persecution as a chance to put you on a, at a place to give you a platform from which you can tell other people about me. So make up your minds not to prepare. This is Jesus. Make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. Don't stress yourself out about, how am I going to defend myself? How am I going to tell them, like, like not get in trouble? How, no, he says, don't, don't stress about that, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. Jesus says, it's not about your charisma. It is not about your debate skills. It's not about your study or preparation even. It's not about your strength. It's not about your wisdom. It's not about your intellect. It's not about your charm. It's about do I trust that God in me can give me the words to say in that moment and it will speak through me and will work in that person's heart that in that moment God is doing all the work. Because it's not about me. It's not about my confidence. It is, con it is a God confidence. God, you are the one doing this in me and through me. This is what a bold witness, a, a bold witness for Jesus looks like. It comes from, where does it come from? It comes from someone who lives full of the Spirit. It comes from someone who is confident in God. And resultantly, thirdly, it comes from someone who shines for Jesus. One last verse. This is, this is amazing. Think of, set the context again. All Stephen is doing is making sure that widows' needs are being met and talking about Jesus. And the result is that he ends up getting forcefully, violently drugged before the most powerful authority in the land. The same group that, 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 um, that saw Jesus and, um, so, uh, and uh, conspired along with the Romans to have Jesus put to death. The same group that Peter and John are brought before it and they are beaten. This is the same, listen, this is not a good thing. He is brought before them. He's accused of speaking blasphemy, which is a big, big deal for the, for the Jewish people. He's blaspheming. He's accused you're blaspheming Moses. You're blaspheming the temple. You're making these outrageous claims about this man, this Nazarene named Jesus that we thought we were done with. Trumped up witnesses are brought in, lying, misrepresenting him. And now every eye in the room, everybody's looking to see what his response is going to be. And in that moment, wouldn't we, if, if he is angry, if he is frustrated, if he is full of rage, we would all say, I could understand it. I could understand exactly why that would be your response. And yet look at what's on his face. What is, is he full of anger? Is he full of rage? Is he full of, uh, is, he, is, 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 is the, the, like the, the spirit has been pushed way down and, and worldliness has come way? No, verse 15, fixing their gaze on him. All who were sitting in the council saw his face like, like the face of an angel. I don't know what that means. We, we know from like when Jesus, is, the empty tomb, the angel is seen there and it says that the angel appeared like lightning with clothing white as snow, angels throughout the that the Bible seemed to be connected to light and radiating and shining forth. We know that Moses in the Old Testament, when he has an encounter with God and experiences something of the glory of God, he comes down off the mountain, that his face is aglow with the glory of God. I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what that means, but in some way, this man who was accused of blasphemy 
stands before them, and even men who do not believe his message see that there is something about his, his countenance that would suggest that this is a man who has been with God. Now, I don't, I don't know, our, our faces may not literally radiate or shine, But my prayer for my life and for yours would be that when men encounter us and bring their accusations and bring their attacks and bring their mocking and bring their ridicule, that when they would look us in the face, that what they would see in us would be there's a man or there's a woman. I can't explain it, and I don't agree with their point of view, but in some way there is something about them that makes it clear that they have been with God. Jesus in Matthew 5 said, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I, here's what I do know from our culture, that when, um, when we are being mocked and when we are being ridiculed and when we are being attacked and when we are being misunderstood and when things in the culture are pointed against us, I will tell you that we are being watched carefully. And the world wants to know if we really believe what we claim we believe. All that talk about grace and all that talk about joy and all that talk about confidence in God and all that talk about walking in the spirit and all that talk about all that love and all that stuff. Then they, when we are being, especially when we are mocked, ridiculed, put on the spot, persecuted, whether in your family or in school or at work or wherever it might be. When the, when the government is putting, oppressing, whatever it is, then the, work, the spotlight is put on us and people's eyes are fixed on us and, and they are looking to see how we respond. And oh, that we would walk with Jesus in such a way that what they would see is Christ radiating through us. Two weeks ago, if you were here, some of you weren't, so I'll, I'll briefly recount it. But I thought it was such a powerful story. Fotis Romeo, our mission partner in Athens, Greece, um, was sharing about his mother who grew up on a small island village of 200 people and um, how she got a Bible of her own and began to read and began to ask questions and uh, in, in a, a, a village that was very controlled by the Greek Orthodox Church. She began to ask questions about, you know, why do I need to come to the priest to deal with my sin? Why can't I go straight to God in prayer? She began to ask real important questions. And as she did, it reached a point where the priest had her excommunicated from the church. And it so um, ostracized her that her parents encouraged her, listen, your only way to really have any seem seeming experience of life is you're going to have to leave here and go somewhere else. And so they encouraged her to leave and to go to the mainland of Greece. And another girl goes with her. And they just began, We're going, we want to talk to people about Jesus. And so they just began to walk and to pray and ask the Spirit to lead them and show them who they were to speak to and what they were to say. And they end up with other believers and they end up in jail and they end up being physically brutally beaten and yet he spoke of his mom and we saw like here was a lady who continued to because she lived trusting in and full of the spirit of God because she was confident in her God because she allowed Christ to shine through her she had she continued to point other people to Christ she had two sons that she poured Jesus into one of them being now one of our partners who from his little spot there in Athens Greece is influencing the nation of Greece and is influencing the nations around him and it's not because of how, it's not because any certainly uh, Photos has charisma and Photos is well spoken and Photos is a brilliant man in many ways but but at the root and the core of it is a man who is allowing the Spirit of God to work through him, who is confident in God's work through him, who lets Jesus shine through him. And now what began as a young girl, bold and full of the Spirit of God, has continued now in, in him and now from photos to others that he is, he is leading. And I believe that's what God, I believe God wants to raise up a new generation of bold witnesses for Christ. And not just in Greece and not just in other parts of the world, but in Chattanooga and in Ringgold and in Saudi Days and, and in Ottawa and, and wherever we come from, God wants to raise up a new generation of bold witnesses. And so at the outset, remember, here's what I told you. And my prayer for us today is that we would see what is it that made Stephen a bold witness, that it would prompt us to pray that God would raise up a generation of such witnesses in our day and that we would be submitted in such a way that we would say, God, I am willing to be one of those witnesses for you. 
And so I want to close in praying toward that end. I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes today and pray with me. And I would just say to us today that if we are not talking to people about Jesus, it is not because we do not care. It is probably because we are not um, living surrendered to the Spirit. And some of you are, man. You, you are in hard places and hard There's a, someone in our, from our body that just this week was talking about some challenges in his community and where, where, where standing up for Jesus means some real hardship in, you know, in that neighborhood. And that's a, that's a reality. And some of you are, are boldly, like you get up daily and you sort of lean into the Spirit's work through you. And we can see that in your life. But I praise God for that. But some of us... Some of us, maybe God is stirring our hearts today to see that maybe the reason why we're not talking about Jesus and the reason why we're afraid to do so is because we are not leaning into the gracious provision of God and his spirit in us to allow his control. Because when the spirit's in control, the spirit comes to exalt Christ. And so if the spirit is in you, then he desires through your life to exalt Jesus. And so So maybe today, maybe today where the place to start would just be through renewed surrender. Maybe today you'd pray in your own words, but maybe I would lead us in praying something like this, that Spirit of God, we are asking you today to fill us afresh. Not in the way that simply brings about some ecstatic utterance or um, some sort of wild um, response, but in that simple but powerful way that we come to the end of ourselves and we invite your good and gracious work through us day by day and moment by moment, acknowledging that we can do nothing of import or value for you, but God, that you will do it all if we will yield to you. God, raise up a generation of bold, unashamed, daring, grace Wisdom, power, faith-filled, spirit-controlled men and women who will not back down in the darkness and the brokenness of our world, but will be inspired by you and your leading to join you in the gracious work you were doing of drawing men and women to yourself. God, make us such a generation. May that be our prayer that you would raise, not only that you would raise up men and women, but that we would look in the mirror and invite you to make us such men and women. Finally, maybe you're here today and you've seen that bold witness in someone in your life who has loved you and who you've seen, you've seen wisdom and you've seen power and you've seen them face hard things and you've seen grace all over them and you'd say, man, I want what they have. And maybe today you would turn your heart to Jesus and say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I believe that you did, in fact, come. I believe that you have brought good news, that you died on the cross in my place, bearing my sin and shame so that through your death and through your resurrection, I can come to you, confess my sin to you, my need for you, and trust in you and your saving work in me and know that you will save me and transform me as I submit to you as my Savior and Lord, my forgiver and my leader. I give my life to you today. God, I pray if there's any man or woman in the room that would pray in that way, that before this day is over, you would lead them to share that good news with others. God, make us bold for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.